Welcome to the Team Teach podcast. I'm Claire, and in each episode, you'll find me talking with an expert guest to learn more about behaviour. We squeeze a lot into each episode. You'll listen to the latest thinking and behaviour, continue your professional development with our book recommendation, and then I'll send you away with three practical tips you can use in your setting. Emma leads a cohort of PGCE primary trainees. She leads behaviour management sessions for all PGCE students and is currently involved in research studies of how trainees' perceptions of managing behaviour develop over their course using graphic elicitation. More on that later. Other research this year focuses on teacher wellbeing um, and especially NQTs. Emma's first book has just been published, TA's Managing Behaviour, a guide for schools, and she is currently writing a book on new approaches to managing behaviour, which will be released as part of an edited series next year. Emma and I today are going to be talking about behaviour and trainee teachers, and we're going to have a little focus on nonverbal communication. Hello, Emma. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. We were having a right old natter um, off air and off recording, um, but it would be really good for you to share about the book that you're reading at the moment. Yeah, so I have been doing lots of reading as part of my writing and something that I'm really interested in um, and that we were chatting about before is solution-focused approaches. Um, And there's a new book out this year about solution-focused approaches, 80 uh, Strategies for Use in the Classroom by uh, Harvey Ratner and uh, Yasmin Ajmal. And it's really, really practical focus. So sometimes um, solution-focused approaches can be a little bit theoretical because it Mm. is a theoretical approach. Um, But this book is brilliant because it's got lots of really, it's got the theory as well, Lots of really useful approaches that you can use to support individuals, groups, uh, whole classes in school. And it's something that I'm really uh, interested in and passionate about sort of developing more. So, yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. Does it link in with like a a more coaching kind of model, but in relation to working with pupils? Is that the kind of? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really broad model. It's used a lot in sort of counselling approaches, but also exactly like you say in those coaching approaches it's very much looking at the skills people already possess um and helping them recognize those and build on those so yeah it's used a lot in coaching um it's used increasingly in teacher supervision as well where teachers are supervised um but it's it's a it's a kind of holistic model really you can use it with anybody for anything um and it is growing in schools which yeah. is, is a really really positive thing no, I, yeah, I'm really, I, I, I was saying off air, but I'm, I'm genuinely, I probably say it about every book that everyone talks to me about, but I genuinely, um, I want to have a little look at that one because I think some of those approaches would be really handy in the schools that I work in. Um, we, we like to also just ease us into the conversation by you talking a bit about your experience in relation to our topic of sort of um, behaviour and supporting trainee teachers. Yeah, so I was a primary school teacher for 17 years. I worked in a range of schools um, with some really, really exciting children um, and some really sort of interesting contexts. And I've spent some time in nurture groups and pupil referral units. Mm. Um, And then I've started doing my kind of research. um, And partway through my research, I stopped teaching and started working as a lecturer in initial teacher education, which I have loved. Mm. Um, And because my kind of background and interest in research is in behaviour, that's an aspect that I um, oversee with my postgraduate trainees, my primary PGCE trainees. And kind of as things have developed over the years, I've been doing more um, research with my trainees on behaviour and sort of increasing the um, behaviour provision, really, the, the talk provision in schools and just becoming more interested in the whole range of strategies and ideas for managing behavior yeah it's that it's really varied what you've done it's I think yeah moving into initial teacher training and after all of that experience yeah I yeah it's nice to 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 have that um what the hell is graphic elicitation (laughs) I know there's not a very good segue into that that was in your bio and I read it and I was like what Emma (laughs) yeah when I tell people I'm doing graphic elicitation, there's sometimes a little bit of a pause because it sounds a little bit dodgy, I think. Um, but sadly, it isn't dodgy. Um, it's really straightforward. Graphic elicitation is just basically drawing pictures um, and then getting people to talk about the pictures they've drawn. So it's used quite a lot with children. 
Yeah. Um, there's a really interesting piece of graphic elicitation, <coughs> a research piece in Australia, um, looking at children's perceptions of teachers, getting them to draw their teachers, which is really, really interesting. So with our trainees, um, me and some of my colleagues are looking at getting our trainees to draw pictures of what they think their role is in terms of managing behaviour in the classroom or supporting children with behaviour in the classroom and looking to see if there's any change in those pictures as the year goes on, as their experience in school goes on, as they develop more confidence and as they're taught uh, sessions on behaviour management develop as well. So if there's like someone that's just like scratched in, in black. Yeah. yeah. We see that that's like the dark side of, of teaching. Yes. Or if they're, you know, locked in a cupboard crying or, you know, <laughs> something like that. We piloted it last year and actually the, the pictures they draw are really, really interesting. So some of them don't have any children in them. Yeah. So some last year didn't have any children. And I think that's because they're so focused on, what they're doing that actually the children almost get forgotten in that sometimes yeah Um, and it's really interesting where they position themselves as that teacher in the classroom what the children are doing Um, and this year there's been some really interesting images that are influenced by covid so that sort of social distancing and children being more firmly in their places you know sat at their desk and the teacher being more that traditional sort of upfront role that's fascinating Yeah. yeah I think really uh, interesting. The the thing that we use maybe that is graphic elicitation as well is that in the pre that I work in on entry, one of the sort of psychological tests that we do as well as academic is that we get the child just to draw a person, like that's part of the the profile, and it helps the ed psych to be able to have a better understanding of that child without meeting them first. So, um, but pictures, you know, I guess they tell a lot, don't they? picture says a thousand words speaks a thousand words whatever the saying is so yeah you are also involved in in graphic elicitation I, and i didn't even know it didn't know that term Learned there you go you say um now i've got that out of the way because i was desperate to <laughs> to ask you that um i know we wanted to to think a little bit about your trainees and their non-verbal cues and communication for managing behavior um how important do you think those non-verbal cues are for your trainees absolutely vital absolutely vital and it's really interesting we were like you say we were chatting before um we came on air and i think it's something that is often overlooked that's something that we don't focus on often enough i think we can tell um when that non-verbal communication isn't right but sometimes i think we don't always attribute that to actually the non-verbal communication we know something's not quite right we know something isn't working um but i don't think we always think about that non-verbal side of things and I was saying to you before when I feed back to students and trainees on behavior and when I work with teachers feeding back to my trainees it's rare that we will actually comment on their non-verbal communication with children even Mm. though it's actually such an important aspect and lots of research suggests that actually even experienced teachers don't take into account how important that non-verbal communication is so there's that, um, that statistic that's often bounded about that lots and lots and lots of research supports that actually 93% of our communication is non-verbal. Mm. And we were joking before about how impressive a, a podcast format is to talk about non-verbal <laughs> communication. And I'm sat here gesticulating yeah, wildly. Yeah, you are. I can vouch for that, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's absolutely essential. And if you think um, just in your day-to-day life about how you communicate non-verbally, my uh, foreign language skills are shockingly desperately poor yeah but i can communicate with somebody whose language i do not speak through non-verbal communication you know if i'm going into a shop trying to get a cake or order something you can manage to do it can't you yeah. through that kind of smiling and pointing and those non-verbal gestures so actually non-verbal communication is something that we all rely on she says gesticulating again yeah got but that. often don't think about so um we watch uh, a clip with our trainees, Amy Cuddy, her yeah. TED Talk, which I think is, is really well known. And she makes that point that actually it's a really key form of communication that we communicate with each other non-verbally, but also we communicate with ourselves non-verbally. And that the signals we give ourselves mm. um, impact on our, on our mental state, our, our physiological uh, communication, yeah. impacts on our thought processes. So it's really, really, really key. And there's some really interesting research but like we were saying before 
actually not a lot of recent research, no. particularly about teachers and nonverbal communication. And in a lot of books that you read about behaviour management, that tends to be skipped over that aspect. So I think it's largely pushed to the side. Yeah, and I think, I, I guess going back to your, your trainees, that it's not necessarily innate to know about nonverbal cues. And I, and I suppose thinking bigger picture that self it's about self-reflection isn't it the ability to self-reflect on yeah. our actions as well as what, what we're saying um but i suppose how how do you help some of your trainees develop um their non-verbal cues and, and presence so we start thinking really sort of um straightforwardly about position in the classroom but before we start talking about that, we talk about things like, so um, Virginia Satir was a, a leading family therapist sort of in the 70s and 80s. And she came up with a range of um, Satir categories that we go through with our trainees. And it's really interesting how many they find they're using. Um, and you make some comments and they're sort of like, oh, yes, I do that. Or I've seen people do that, but I didn't realize what it meant. So one of the key ones that we talk about is the blaming posture, which you can see trainees do when they get into a flap. Um, and it's certainly something that I use in my personal life, <laughs> which is where you sort of lean forward and you point at somebody, you know, that kind of wagging the finger at somebody. And of course, that's um, it implies fault. It seems aggressive. But it's something that when you panic, when you're... Uh, endorphins are raised when your mm. cortisol is raised you can tend to sort of come out with without thinking and i make my trainees do that to each other yeah so they can understand the impact that it has and how it makes the the person that it's done to feel so we sort of move on from that and two really interesting ones are the placator and the leveler mm. so the placator is that um that position where you're sort of dipped slightly you've got your weight on one foot and interestingly you've got your palms up Mm. and that can be passive so it can be sort of um, a position that you don't want to get yourself in so for example I say to my trainees if you are stood at the front of the class and you are trying to give direct instruction if you are stood like that how does it feel stand in front of a couple of people how mm. does it feel how does it make you feel what's the impact on somebody else and then we do the leveler which is kind of a grounded stance you've got both feet firmly on the floor and you've got your palms down mm. and there's a really really interesting clip by um richard newman where he talks about that difference between palms up and palms down and once you've noticed it you can't then not no. notice it. so the palms up is a kind of listening gesture and the palms down is a stop so this palms up is open it's inviting questions palms down is stop it's that's the end of the discussion that's really interesting because i do de-escalation training and um we often do like a calming stance which is often now it's really interesting you say that because often i say it doesn't matter you can have your palms up <laughs> or you can have your palms down it doesn't really matter but actually that clip and that evidence maybe is stating that they would have two different functions that's interesting yeah and i get my trainees to say are you ready with their palms up and are you ready with their palms down? And it's really interesting. As, a, as a, somebody who's been in front of children quite a lot, one you almost can't do because it doesn't fit your, what you are saying with your body and what you are saying verbally don't match. And you can feel that mismatch. It makes you feel really uncomfortable. And I think for our trainees, when they are beginning to gain confidence and gain experience in the classroom, they sometimes don't feel that mismatch between what they are saying verbally Yeah. And what they are saying non-verbally. But the children immediately pick up on that mismatch between actually he or she is saying one thing, but their body is telling me something else. Yeah, that's so interesting. And you can almost train the kids, can't you? That what my non-verbal cues and my hands pointing down is like, we're listening. <laughs> and this is now it's question time. That's yeah. not actually for trainees having, you know, we were talking before about how as a trainee, I knew I, I wanted a set of rules to stick to. And this is how I want everything to be black and white, because I, I don't know enough to apply things using my own knowledge base. But there's something like that. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that helps, doesn't it, with consistency? And yeah. Jack and I, uh, Jack, 
uh, Taylor, who I've just spoken to about consistency and recorded an episode. Um, we want to be consistent in our body language, uh, I suppose. And that, you know, is one way. Yeah, I think that's really key. And I think particularly for my trainees who don't always have that confidence, um, there isn't always that consistency between their body language and what they say. Mm. And again, that's really difficult. So simple simple strategies like that are really, really useful. Just that, you know, palms up, I'm asking yeah. a question, palms down, I'm stopping. And actually, when you watch teachers, when they're trying to get the children's attention, sometimes they can do it without saying anything. And my trainees say, how on earth have they done that? They just did something and all the children stopped. But quite often for the children, it's that recognised body language. It's that, okay, let's stop that, palms down, everybody stop. And the yeah. children recognise instantly. And actually, you don't, you don't have to communicate verbally because you can communicate that non-verbally. Yeah, I remember in my first high school uh, and where I trained, I remember I'd been, I maybe worked there two years because you take a bit of time to get established. And I remember there was a cover lesson going on with year sevens and it was absolute chaos. And I just walked into the room, stood, and then silence ensued. And I remember walking away from that and saying, I've got it. I understand now. Um, some of it's about being established, but some of it yes. is that confidence because I know I'm established. And I guess going back to that, um, that talk about body language on, what should you call it, Amy? Um, Amy Cuddy. Cuddy, that's it. Um, that actually you start to believe it, don't you, um, as well. But that, yeah, fascinating stuff. I wanted to also ask you, because sometimes people might have different views about behaviour training on, you know, the PGCE. And I, I guess <laughs> I was wondering, you know, maybe it comes up sometimes about why, why do we bother having the behaviour management training? training on a PGC shouldn't we be more focusing on curriculum what do you think about that yeah it's it's for me a surprisingly contentious area and I'm always really interested here I know places like Twitter naturally polarize views but there is a real um kind of dichotomy between those people who think they should just be taught rewards and sanctions boom that's it the kind of what I would see is that sort of um layer of tips mm. and tricks but for me I think managing behavior is a fundamental aspect of the way you relate to children and actually for me and I hope for the trainees that I work with they see managing behavior or supporting children uh, in their behavior as a as a relationship based aspect that mm. actually underpins everything you do with children and there's a really interesting piece of research about how um how actually the way you communicate with your children non-verbally impacts on their academic perceptions mm. so actually how they see themselves um and we were just talking before about how important that non-verbal communication is in terms of managing behavior and working with children so for me unless unless the trainees see managing behavior as a really sort of holistic underpinning to everything they're going to do um I don't feel like I'm doing my job properly, really. It'd be really easy to say to them, oh, here's a list of tips and tricks that you can use with most children most of the time. But I feel that would be a, a disservice to the children they're going to work with and to the students, really. It would, and a, a colleague of mine at the PRU that I, I work in shared with me um, a bit of research on how many um, sort of quite newly qualified teachers leave the profession. <gasps> I can't remember the exact percent after three years. It was massive. Yeah. But if you stick it for more than three years, then it drops and drops and drops as you get more experience. But I suppose the essence of doing your teacher training is that you have the skills to help you to continue for as long as possible and the sort of training that you're offering is that holistic approach which is you know only going to help because tips and tricks aren't gonna you know get you that very far no I talked to my students about um the concept of a behavior suitcase so Sproston in 2004 he was actually talking about the children but he said all children should have a suitcase full of strategies that help them manage their own behavior and that you as a teacher help them fill that suitcase with lots and lots of different strategies. And he said that as a teacher, or the implication was, as a teacher, you need a really wide range of strategies that children can pick from and put in their own suitcase to support them. So for me, if I'm only talking about one method of managing behaviour or one method of supporting behaviour with the students that I work with, they're not going to be able to help that wide range of children they're going to work with over however many years fill their suitcases and support them. And also, I think if you've only got one strategy, 
everything becomes a nail because you've only got a hammer. And if that hammer doesn't work, you, you're sort of lost, aren't you? And that, again, for my students, that's where that, that panic comes in and that, mm. <clears throat> that real concern that if I do this and it doesn't work, what, what can I do now? Yeah. And that's where we talk a lot about developing those relationships and how relationships are really, really key and they're going to underpin all the work you do with children because there are days when that one strategy might not work. Yeah, many days uh, <laughs> in my experience, yes. many, many days. Um, I was saying um, about, I did the graduate teacher route or, or you know, whatever it was called, sort of <gasps> six, 16, 17 years ago. And um, we had maybe four or five days at university. And one of those days, or maybe a half day was uh, behavior management training. And the woman that ran the training was lovely, but she'd worked in sort of all girls schools and, and grammar schools. And I was working in a, deprived area sort of high school I swear this is what she said on the behavior management training that all you need is your marker pen and you tap three times to get the class's attention and I just nearly spat out my cup of tea (laughs) I've been in the classroom for about maybe six months already when I had that brilliant behavior training and you know it's I guess in different settings you need different strategies but I really wish that I'd had that holistic approach because I had to learn on the job so much which is fine and actually that's probably done me really well and helped me to be really reflective but actually I think so many times as a trainee I felt really lonely um you know with my class because you did you you, I maybe there's more TAs now in classroom teaching but I didn't normally have a TA it was just me and a you know a group of 30 kids with zero strategy zero experience apart from this (laughs) Which you know. surely you don't need more than that. But... No, it got your attention though, so that was... Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's some research that suggests that teaching is like an egg box, uh, which I think is really, really, really interesting in that you're all in together as teachers, but actually you are separated. So, of course, when you shut your classroom door, it can yeah. be, even though you're surrounded by other people, it can be a really isolating experience. Yeah. Um, and that's why we talk again about the importance of relationships, not just relationships between you and the children, but actually forming those positive, supportive relationships with the people that are mentoring you, the people that you work with. You don't have to be friends with them, but you need to be able to have that professional dialogue so you can say, oh, I'm really struggling or um, this worked really, really well. Have you got any ideas about how I could build on that or, or support that? Because managing behaviour is such a, a visible aspect of teaching, isn't it? If you go in to do a maths lesson and you may be, doing addition of fractions and you sort of haven't quite got the subject knowledge, you might be able to cope, you might be able to get around it. But if you struggle to manage behaviour, it's much more of a visible aspect. If the children are bombing about or shouting mm. or whatever they might be doing, it's, it's a really clearly observable aspect of your practice that is not going well. Um, so having those positive relationships where you can say to people, I'm really worried or can you support me in this? Or I'm really, really pleased with this. Will you come and watch it and tell me what you think are, are essential for trainees and qualified teachers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the best professional development I had, particularly when I was working in a PRU, was having the opportunity to observe my peers, not in a formal process, but just to pop in for half an hour. And my subject specialism's um, English, and I went into a maths lesson, which you think, oh, that won't correlate. Behaviour management-wise, it gave me so many ideas. Of, yeah. you know, just like organisation, because I'm stereotyping maths teachers of, of having more organisational skills as me. But just some of those small things that she did as a, a teacher, I could take away and apply in, in my own subject area. And that's, that's the best CPD, right? Seeing good people doing good jobs um, and learning from, from them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as you as you go along your teaching career, the opportunities to observe other people and sort of steal their good practice magpie from them reduces, yeah. which is a real shame, isn't it? And again, I think unless you um unless you see lots of practice when you're starting, again, like you say, your opportunities for taking bits of practice and using them and embedding them or trying them out in your your teaching limits get limited. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm getting conscious um, of time a little bit and we're going to, I think it's been, we've probably done um, over 15 minutes, which is usual for the podcast anyway. Uh, But I just wondered if you could leave us with three practical tips, um, Emma, 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I will try anyway. Um, I suppose for me, the big one is, um, she says a practical tip. I'm going to give something completely impractical now, but it's not think about those or focus on those kind of tips and tricks that some books and, you know, um, blogs and things like that sometimes focus on, but think about how, when, and where you can develop those relationships with children. Is it a chat about football at playtime? Is it a smile when they come into school in the morning and a nod really think about how you can embed those relationships. Um, another thing that is, was really important for me, um, and that I use a lot with my trainees, is John Visser's concept of eternal verities. So if you Google that, it's really easily findable. So eternal verities are eternal truths that he suggested underpin your practice um, with all children. His paper there is particularly about children whose behavior challenges, but really factors that should underpin all of your good practice with children. Worth a read. It's really, really, really interesting and really practical as well. Um, and my final one, I suppose, would be to have a sense of humour. <laughs> Teaching can be the most uh, enjoyable and hilarious job in the world. Uh, children will make you laugh, will make you smile. Um, they will laugh at you and with you. So just to try and keep a sense of humour, really. Yeah, you've got to laugh or you'll cry. Oh, what we absolutely. Say. Oh, thank you so much, Emma. That's the first time we've had top tips where the, the first one says, uh, don't use top tips. <laughs> so, you Emma's know. so helpful. Thank you uh, for that one. Yeah, maybe we'll have to change the format based, uh, based on that. Um, no, it's been really interesting. And um, what I'll do with some of the research that you've mentioned when I edit it, I'll put some notes at the bottom and some links, which will be really useful, useful for people listening. Uh, but thanks so much for your time, Emma, and, and hopefully we'll catch up with you soon. You've been listening to the Team Teach podcast. It's been great to have you here with us as we discuss behaviour, communication and the ways we can best support those in our care. There are plenty more helpful ideas, information and inspiration right here in the Team Teach hub. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.